part 7 of the hands-on big data screencast version of the workshop. I'm Ryan Womack, data librarian at Rutgers University. Uh, this is a very short um, section where I'm just going to talk through a couple of slides. So we've been referring all along to the Hadoop ecosystem and we've seen a few pieces of that in action. The the interactive programming environments, but there are other bits, and I just want to highlight some of those just so you know what these are. Um, we've seen Hue. Hue is the web administra administrative interface, or a web administrative interface. Uzi, we've talked about just a bit, that's the workflow scheduler. So when a job launches in Hue, it calls on Uzi to um, schedule the job and make sure there are resources available. When you actually go into, uh, and the slides here have links, these are pretty much all Apache projects, so you can go directly into the documentation uh, for those. When you're running a large cluster, uh, the administrative burdens become quite high. You don't want to be individually logging in on the command line to a hundred different machines and running, you know, updates and configuration commands. So a lot of these tools that are developed for Hadoop are uh, to help you with with those things. So Zookeeper, as it says here, is an effort to coordinate. Uh, it provides a server that coordinates and synchronizes things across all these group services. Uh, and then it gets technical real fast if you um, are actually using it, but Zookeeper is a big help for, uh, you know, maintaining a similar version of of software across your cluster. Uh, Ganglia is a project that has some monitoring software. So we've seen monitoring functions in Hue. Uh, Ganglia has its own. Uh, we're going to see the Ambari interface which combines monitoring and administration. So some of these Ganglia functions are present in Ambari. So I'm not going to show Ganglia as a separate uh, object. We are going to see Ambari in action when we look at the Microsoft Azure Cloud that's coming up in a future segment. Um, mention a little bit about data frameworks. So we've talked about the HDFS Hadoop file system. There are many other things that are done with big data. Um, Cassandra is a database that can handle really big files but focuses on column performance. So uh, you know if you know that you're just going to be accessing one variable at a time and, and doing some operations on that particular variable, that's what I mean by column access. Uh, Cassandra is very good for that and it, it, you know, it extends database functionality out into the big data world. Um, and you know, several other variants. HBase is similar to Google's Big Table uh, for sparse data, data that has a lot of not available or blank entries in the cells. We're going to talk about that later as well. Uh, MongoDB is a NoSQL database, so a database. NoSQL is a particular kind of a less structured format than an SQL database. Uh, then we have tools for handling the data. So Scoop lets you transfer data between Hadoop and traditional relational databases. We saw a few, you know, little command line get and put type commands. Scoop is more full featured and, and automates some things. Flume, uh, because it can handle server logs like a log flume, uh, can take live web server logs that are being collected from all over the place and let them flow into a Hadoop file system. So this is an example of something that's designed you know, to handle large quantities of live streaming data and make it useful in the Hadoop ecosystem. Um, the, you know, there are more projects than what's mentioned on the slides. I'm just um, highlighting some of the, the frequently discussed ones. Uh, you can go to the Apache site and see more. Um, the presence of all these different tools is the reason, you know, when people say Hadoop uh, as a solution for big data, they mean Hadoop 
plus all these other helper uh, applications and software that's been developed so that you can do not only Hadoop but connect Hadoop to everything else and and get your jobs done. And so uh, since we've been talking about the data uh, formats this is a, a, a simple concept uh, that I think is useful for people who haven't thought about databases to be familiar with. Um, I've alluded to it throughout that there's a difference between the structured database world of like an Oracle database or a MySQL database where the setup is very well specified and things that, that live in specific tables have to be well behaved. They have to um, be strings if we say they're strings and uh, abide by field lengths and things like that. When you have uh, you know, web logs and, and input flowing in from lots of different places, the data is not structured in that sense. Um, and so what happens uh, in a traditional database, the, the term they use for it is an ACID compliant database. ACID meaning atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable. So ACID databases are what enable you to do banking transactions, for example. When I hit um, submit on, you know, I want to complete my bill payment, uh, and anything goes wrong along the way, there's an ability to say, this transaction did not complete successfully. Um, let's roll everything back to where we started before this person tried to deduct $400 from their account and it didn't go through. Um, so we can, and we can treat all those transactions separately, uh, keep them isolated, and you know have this kind of reliability in in every transaction on the database. That's ACID compliance, and that's why people build traditional databases. These large-scale web databases are operating under a different paradigm called BASE basically available soft state and eventual consistency. So what this means is, you know, over time, you know, we might have a field or a space in, you know, someone's user account is logging, you know, their searches and things like that. Um, and it's getting updated. And it'll eventually be updated and it, it, the data is being spread acra out across multiple nodes. So eventually we have a mechanism where we're refreshing the nodes uh, to the latest data and they are eventually consistent. They are eventually um, going to be similar, but we don't guarantee that they're similar at every single second. We, we may have one fresh node and one stale node. Uh, the stale node is going to be kind of out of sync for a while. And this is really the only way that you can deal with, with really big data. The overhead of keeping everything fully synced up all the time is, is just too large when you're dealing with you know, terabytes and terabytes of data. Um, so you may hear these paradigms, base versus acid. And I just wanted to say a few words about that so that you're familiar with those. OK, so I'm going to stop here for this little mini section. The next section, we are going to show you what the Microsoft Azure cloud looks like. And I'll pause the video right now.